Good morning, everybody. Good to see everyone today on this beautiful Lord's Day. It's starting to cool off a little bit, and I know we're all enjoying all these a little bit milder temperatures. Probably have a lot of folks traveling on our Labor Day weekend, but we want to keep everyone in our prayers and be thankful that we are here. We get to enjoy some time together. As uh, you might I have guessed I wanted to do something just a little bit different today. Uh, last week we were in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, and we uh, were discussing the two natures of Christ. And after class, a lot of you had some questions and were really interested in that. And so I thought it might be helpful, or at least it would be interesting or fun for me to uh, discuss this a little bit more in detail this morning. And so what we're doing is taking a little excursus from Philippians 2 to discuss the two natures of Christ. So that's uh, my plan today, and then we'll get back into Philippians as soon as this is over. Do we have any prayer requests this morning? We want to continue to pray for Miss Donna and Miss Regina and her recovery from her two knee surgeries. Continue to pray for uh, uh, Brother Charles Ellis back there having some neck trouble. Anybody else? All right. Well, let's pray and we'll get started this morning. Our God, we are so thankful for the many wonderful blessings that you've given us every second of our lives. We are especially thankful to be called your children. Father, we are thankful that you are our God, that you are great and wonderful beyond our description. Father, we stand in awe of you. We are so thankful for the opportunity to come and praise you this morning, as well as to learn from you as you speak to us in your word. Father, we pray that you'll continue to be merciful, forgive all of our sin, that you'll bless Miss Regina as she recovers, that you will continue to be with Brother Charles and help him to have some comfort, I'll be with the doctors working with him. Father, we pray that you will be with all those who are suffering in very uh, different ways. We pray, Father, that you will continue to uh, be with Miss Donna, now that you will be with uh, Curtis McCollum and his family as they uh, continue to mourn the loss of his brother. Father, we pray that you will bless us always. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So as we were looking there in Philippians chapter 2, one of the things that we noted was that Jesus has these two natures. As the incarnate Lord, He has two natures. He is true God and true human. That He is both fully divine and fully human at the same time. Now as we begin to think about that, of course there are some difficulties because there's absolutely nothing else like this. There's absolutely nothing that we can compare the incarnation to. Everything else has one nature. If you're a dog, you're a dog. If you're a cat, you're a cat. If you're a lizard, you're a lizard. If you're a person, you're a person. I mean a human person. But here Jesus is one person with two natures. Now the big a uh, word for that that's really way too small on the screen there. It got smaller on me or something. Uh, but the big word for that is the hypostatic union. Has anybody heard that phrase before? Hypostatic union? Hypostasis? Maybe? All right. Well, the word hypostatic just has to do with person. Uh, this is the way the ancient Greeks talked about being a person. They would call you a hypostasis. So, not only are you a person... But you're also a hypostasis. You might call somebody that sometime. You know, you get sort of flustered with them. You say, well, you're quite the hypostasis, right? Well, that just means that they're a person. But here in Christ, we have the joining of two natures in one person. Jane, I'm going to baptize this clicker. All right. Okay. So let's begin by focusing on the deity of Christ. As we look in these several passages that I have for you, I want you to go ahead and open your Bible and begin there in John chapter 1. Because the deity of Christ is one of the first things that finds a lot of emphasis in the Gospels. As we see Jesus being born, of course the assumption is that He is a true human. It's not until later that we find this discussion on whether or not Jesus was truly human. The big question at the beginning is whether or not Jesus is fully human. God. So as we're looking there in John chapter 1, we read, In the beginning was the Word. Now this phrase, in the beginning, means before time. 
before the beginning, before Genesis 1, before creation. This is the way everything was being. In the beginning was the Word. The Word is the full expression, the full communication of what God is. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Whatever God was, the Word was. So there in John 1, John gives us this, this affirmation that Jesus is true God. He's not a smaller God. He's not a lower God. He is exactly like God the Father and exactly like God the Spirit. So also we want to flip over to John chapter 10 and verse 30. John 1 is probably uh, the first place that most of us would go whenever we're asked about the deity of of Christ, whether or not we believe that Jesus is true God, what we affirmed when we were baptized, when we said that we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, uh, this is probably the first place that we would go in the New Testament to show that Jesus is true God. But then again in John chapter 10 and verse 30, Jesus says, I and the Father, I and the Father are one. Now, this does not mean that they are the same person. It does not mean that they are the same person. There are some religious groups even today who believe that Jesus, the Father, and the Spirit are one person with three names, right? They believe that they're one person with three names. Now, this is not correct. Uh, this is a heretical uh, doctrine that's been around for some 1,700 years, okay? But when Jesus says, I and the Father are one, he is saying that they are two persons who share the same essence. Two persons who share the same essence. So there is this one divine essence from which we have Father, Son, and Spirit. What we want to grasp at the most fundamental, easiest level is that when Jesus says, I and the Father are one, he is saying that I am exactly like the Father. I am true God, just like the Father is. Now flip over to Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 is another instance of us looking forward to the Christ whenever we see His birthplace predicted. Someone read, see Kenny, you're down here in the front. Uh, get Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 for us. What we find there, though, is something interesting about who Jesus really is. Micah 5 and verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me, the one to be the ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. All right. So we see two things. The first thing that we're more familiar with is that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, the house of David. But the other part that is equally important is this last part of Micah 5 2, where the Bible says that you are, your goings are from of old, from ancient of days. Now that is code in the Bible for being eternal, for being God, because only God is from of old. Only God is of ancient of days. So what we find there in Micah 5, 2 is that this eternal God in some way is going to be born in Bethlehem. It's not just a magnificent prophecy about Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. It is also showing us that this birth will take place uh, in Bethlehem, but that this birth is the birth of the eternal, timeless God. So then we are finding evidence again that Jesus is true God. Look also in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Does anybody have that one? Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. We see there that we have this one like the Son of Man, who is brought forth to the Ancient of Days, and presented to Him there. But what is this one who is like the Son of Man? What is He doing? How does He get there? How is He presented to the Ancient of Days? If you read there in Daniel 7, I believe you'll find the Bible says He's riding on the clouds. Right? 
He is riding on the clouds. Now that's a weird thing. Who gets to ride on the clouds? Only God gets to do that. I would say, you know, something about people in an airplane, but that's sort of dangerous to talk about right now, isn't it? Uh, but uh, only God, in the Bible, only God gets to ride on the clouds. So we have one likened to the Son of Man who is also riding on the clouds. He's also true God. He does things that only God is able to do. So what are we finding here in these prophecies about Jesus? that He is going to be one like the Son of Man, but He is also true God. He is born in Bethlehem, but at the same time, He is eternal. Uh, Psalm chapter 2 in verse 7. Psalm chapter 2 in verse 7 is one of the, uh, one of the uh, ancient ways of proving the deity of Christ. Uh, the very earliest Christians for a few hundred years would go here to Psalm 2 first. It says, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed. Now the word anointed there is the same, the Hebrew word Messiah. Anytime you see the word anointed in the Old Testament, it's the word Messiah. The Hebrew word Messiah. So they are gathered together against the Lord and His who? His Messiah. Right? So they are against the Lord and against His Messiah. They say, let us burst their bonds apart and cast their way, their cords from us. But He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. He will speak to them in His wrath and terrify them in His fury, saying, as for me, I have set my King on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now when did Jesus begin to do all of these things? When was this God's plan rather? Well, it was eternally God's plan, was it? It was eternally God's plan. This is eternally the way it is. That He has eternally set His King over everything. Who is the King? Jesus is the King, right? There are other kings that get us ready for Jesus, like David and Solomon. There are other kings that get us ready to appreciate what Jesus is going to do. But Jesus is the King. He's the one that everyone else is looking to. So He is described there as His King... And then also he is described as God's son. He is described as God's son. Now what does it mean to be a son? It means that you share the same nature as your father. Now when we talk about God the son and God the father, we're not talking about physical things. And so begetting and begotting, uh, that sort of an idea. Begetting and begetting. What am I talking about? This idea of begetting, uh, it does not function in a physical human way. But what we're being told here is that Jesus is the true Son of God. That He shares this same essence with the Father. So Psalm 2 is repeatedly used in the New Testament to prove the deity of Christ. That He is the Son of God eternally. That He never became the Son of God. He never was exalted to have a position of, of, of equality with the Father. But He is eternally the Son of God. He is eternally equal with God. Flip back over now to the New Testament in John chapter 20 and verse 28. John chapter 20 and verse 28. There again we find another affirmation of Jesus being the Christ. Where Thomas is presented with the evidence. And what does he describe Jesus as? He says to Jesus... You are my Lord and my God. You are my Lord and you are my God. We see the same confession over in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16, don't we? When Peter and the others are asked, Who do you say that I am? The great confession is made there in Matthew 16 and verse 16, that thou art the Christ the Son of the living God. 
You are the Messiah. You are the eternal Son of the living God. Where do we find those two things together? Where does Peter get this confession? That's Psalm 2, isn't it? Remember? Against the Lord and against His Messiah, which is Hebrew for Christ, Christos in Greek. And so what Peter is saying is, you are the one from Psalm 2. You are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. Again, in John chapter 8, in verse 58, we see the deity of Christ. There, uh, sometimes liberal scholars will say that Jesus never claimed to be God. That Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, let's look here in John 8 and verse 58. Uh, we really need to go back to verse uh, 56, really. He says, Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said, You are not yet 50 years old. How have you seen Abraham? Well, according to the flesh, this would have been impossible, wouldn't it? This would have been impossible. Abraham was around some 1,800 years before Jesus. But at not his human nature, but his divine nature, then we see that in his deity, Jesus is there, isn't he? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. That he is in existence. He is being. Even before Abraham was. Now there's something even more significant about this, isn't there? Because who is the great I am? God is. That's Exodus 3. Jesus here is saying, I am eternal. I am there being even before Abraham. But then the way that he does it points us to Jesus being the I am of Exodus 3. So then we see in Philippians 2, 6 that he was in the form of God. We examined this last week, but he's in the form of God. Look over again, though, in Hebrews chapter 1, especially here in uh, verses 1 through 8, really. But we read there long ago at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son the one who shares his essence, whom he has appointed to be heir of all things, through whom also he created the worlds. He is the radiance of the glory of God. Whenever you see that, you're seeing again what it means for Jesus to be the Son. To be a son means that you share the same essence of your Father. What do you think of when you see the radiance of light? What does light radiate? It just radiates more light, does it? Right? So He is the radiance of the glory of God. He is the same thing as God. He is, he is this way of God as far as His essence is concerned. He is the exact imprint of His nature. The word for nature there is really person. The Greek word is hypostasis. Remember I told you that you were all hypostasis? Well, the Greek word here is hypostasis. He is the exact imprint or character. The Greek word is actually character. He is the character of his person. I think we could just go ahead and transliterate both those words. He is the character of his hypostasis, the character of his person. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for his sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become much superior to the angels as his name, as the name he has inherited is far more excellent than theirs. Then here in Hebrews 1, Whoever's preaching this, whoever's writing this, goes back to where? Psalm 2. To prove the deity of Christ. That this is not just about kings in Israel, but rather this is about the eternal Son of God. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son today, I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the son, he says, your throne, O God. Who is God speaking to here? All right. God the Father is speaking to God the Son. What does God the Father call God the Son? He calls Him God. Right? 
So God the Father calls God the Son God. He says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. In other words, it's timeless, it's eternal. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You've loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, you're God. Now, how does that work? You have to have God the Son and God the Father, don't you? Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. The idea of being anointed again is the same Hebrew word Messiah, the anointed one, the chosen one. So, uh, he goes on here in verse 10, that you, Lord, who's this talking to? It's talking to Jesus, isn't it? You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them, roll them up, and like a garment they will be changed but you are the same, and your years have no end. Look at what God is saying to His Son. He's saying that you are God. You are my Son. You share my essence. You are the Creator God. And you are God just like I am God. This is what God the Father says to God the Son. Look at the... Uh, book of Titus now, in Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Again here we see that Jesus is what? Our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is our great God and and He is our Savior. Now, not only do we have the claims that Jesus is divine, but we also see that Jesus does things that only God can do. Flip back over to John chapter 10 for a moment. And in John chapter 10, we find the argument that Jesus gives so that people should know that He really is true God. John chapter 10, beginning in verse 25, Jesus says, I told you and you do not believe, but the works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. And the Jews picked up these stones to stone him. And Jesus says, I have shown you many good works from the Father, for which of them are you going to stone me? First question, why do the Jews want to stone Jesus? Because he's making himself to be equal with God. And what is his proof? It's the works that he's doing even there in his human nature. Even there through his human nature, he is still doing the works of God, which prove that he is God. And so they want to stone him here because they are accusing him of blasphemy. Uh, let's go over to John chapter 1 and verse 43. John chapter 1, 43. I like this one because... Um, I didn't recognize just how much uh, was given to us in the text until a few years ago. But the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth. Now the word Nazareth just means nothing. Okay, uh, So to be from Nazareth is to be from literally the middle of nowhere. right? So can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said, well come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Here we have omniscience, don't we? He knows him before he ever knew him. He is fully omniscient. Then Nathanael said, how do you know me? Now, before we go any further, go back up to verse 46. Nathanael had to come and see. Why did Nathanael have to come and see? Because Nathanael wasn't there with Jesus. 
Nathaniel is finite. He's in a particular location. Come and see. Now go back down here to verse 48 now. How do you, uh, Nathaniel said to uh, Jesus, before, he said, how do you know me? Jesus answered, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. How did Jesus see him? Not only is he omniscient, he knows everything, but he is still yet, even though his human nature is finite, his divine nature is infinite, and he's what? Omnipresent in his divine nature. Both these things are true at the same time. That the human body is finite. It's in a particular place. Nathaniel has to come and see. But Jesus, because he is true God and true man, is also omniscient. He knows everything. He knows Nathaniel. And he is omnipresent. He saw him under the fig tree. It didn't say, I knew you were under the fig tree. The Bible says, I saw you under the fig tree. Now that's only possible because we have the two natures together in one person. Let's look again in 1 John chapter 5, um, uh, and verse 12. I really like that story of Philip and Nathaniel. It's not really about Philip and Nathaniel. It's really about the deity of Christ, isn't it? Okay. So, uh -huh. Right? You are the son, you are the king. What's that all about? That's Psalm 2, right? That's Psalm 2 again. So let's look in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 12. We see again the work that Jesus does is something that only God can do. Uh, really going back to verse 11. This is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. So whoever has the Son has life, and whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Who gave eternal life? God did. Who gives eternal life? The Son does. Why? Because He is true God. Uh, so we again see that this most important activity of God is given by the Son, because He is the Son, because He is true God. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, uh, we again, I better hurry. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16, we see the true deity of Christ, that all the fullness of God dwelt in Him bodily. Uh, let's flip over to Acts chapter 20. Uh, Y'all can take a picture of that. I thought my students were taking pictures of me, but they're really taking pictures of the slides. So y'all can take pictures of those and have them for yourself if you like. Yeah, they, were, they, they weren't taking pictures of me. I was kind of disappointed. But well, fine then. All right, uh, but let's look over in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. And we see there that the Apostle Paul says something interesting about Jesus, that God purchased the church with his own blood. Now, God does not have a body, He does not have blood, but the Bible says that God purchased the church with His own blood. In order for this to work, you have to have one person, right, His own blood. You have to have one person who is God and also true human. Acts 20 and 28 does not work without the Incarnation. All right, so let's flip over uh, to the humanity of Christ. Think about something different for just a second. Back over here in 1 John chapter 2, in verses 22 and 23, we find John being very direct with a very real problem there in the first century. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, and verses 22 and 23. Uh, there, John says... Uh, who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He, do not, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you, and that which you heard from the beginning abides in you. You too will abide in the Son and in the Father, and this is the promise that He made to us, eternal life. Now, the problem here in 1 John is that there are some who are denying that Jesus had a real physical body. 
They're saying he did not have a real body. But look back over to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 1. That which was from the beginning, that which was before the beginning, that which we have heard, seen, looked on, touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Look at these very physical ways that a non-physical, eternal God is described. The Word that was from the beginning. We have heard Him, seen Him, looked at Him, and touched Him. You see, God doesn't have a body. He can't be felt in these ways. Except for the Son of God who has put on flesh. Uh, very importantly, let's go quickly back to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Uh, John chapter 20 and verse 24, where Thomas, as you'll remember, wasn't at church on Wednesday night, and so he has to come back and see Jesus a second time. But Jesus there in John 20, verses 24 to 28, provides John with evidence. John, uh, Thomas rather, says, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Thomas says, banking his Christian faith on whether or not Jesus has a real human body, on whether or not Jesus is true human. And what does Jesus do? He immediately appears, then what? Or eight days later he appears and he says to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Put, your, put out your hand, place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. What is the response? Jesus, before the resurrection and after the resurrection, has a physical body that can be examined. He has a human nature. Right? So Jesus then, it, we've already proven or seen from Scripture that He is true God. We have also seen here the humanity of Christ, that He has a true human nature. Look also in Luke chapter 2 and verse 52. Luke chapter 2 and verse 52. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 52, we have some things said of Jesus that can only be said of the human nature. Some things said of Jesus that can only be said of the human nature of Jesus. They can't be said of the divine nature because the divine nature just can't do this stuff. Right? Because it's perfect, it can't be imperfect. But the Bible says that Jesus grew in, well, first of all, that he grew. Can God get any bigger or better? He just can't do it, can he? But the Bible says that Jesus grew in wisdom. Can God get more wise? Well, that won't work, will it? Can God get physically bigger? Well, no, God is spirit. He doesn't have a physically, and uh, it's infinite already. So, when the Bible says that Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man... These are all things that God in the divine nature just cannot do. But the human person of Jesus, or the human nature of Jesus, can do these things because it's a true human existence, a true human nature. Notice also here, we have already read and just sort of assume that Jesus has a divine mind, right? So whenever we read this interaction with Nathaniel, None of you guys were really surprised when Jesus knew who Nathaniel was. You're like, yeah, he has a divine mind. Of course, he's Jesus. But look at what we see here in Luke chapter 2 and verse 52. Does Jesus also have a human mind? Yes. He has a human mind as well. So what we find in Hebrews chapter 2, that he became like us, like, us, like his brethren in every way, it's true that we have a true divine nature and we have a true human nature, including the human mind or soul. Right? These are the two things of Jesus, the two natures of Jesus, that He is true God and true man. 
Now, as we begin to look at this, the major question then is, how can this be? I always like to say, first of all, embrace the mystery. There's literally nothing else like this. Jesus is the only one. And if we try to figure it out, we'll, or if we try to own it uh, logically, we're going to come out with some sort of an error that we'll look at in a minute. But the first thing that we have to do is accept it by faith. Uh, one of my uh, favorite uh, writers back from the 14th century says, I believe in order to understand. I'm never going to understand everything, but I believe, and this belief helps me to understand. So we're never going to understand how Jesus, we're never going to understand perfectly, how Jesus can be one person with two natures, but this is what the biblical evidence leads us to believe. And so we believe it, and then we try to understand as we go on. So as we're looking at this then... Where am I going? Okay. So we have already looked at Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. We see the presence of both natures as God purchased the church with His own blood. Uh, in Philippians 2, 5 through 8, we see the presence of both natures as He is in the form of God. Right? Philippians 2, 5. But then, or verse 6. Uh, but then we also see that He took a lower rank, taking the form of a servant, being found in human form. He suffered even to death on the cross. So both of these are true of Christ. That He is true human and true God. So, a lot of folks today, and this is why it's important that we have a lesson like this, because a lot of folks today believe that Jesus in some way stopped being divine and started being human. That He stopped being divine and started being human. Now, you don't have to raise your hands and make a confession, but when I've done surveys like this before, I find that about 90 or 90 plus percent of the people think that in some way Jesus' deity was limited. That He stopped being divine in some way so that He could become human. This is a heresy, okay? This is wrong. The Bible says that the divine nature cannot change. Uh, Malachi 3.6, right? What does Malachi 3.6 say? I, the Lord, change not. Therefore you are not destroyed, O house of Israel. I do not change. The divine nature does not change. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter, uh, I'm sorry, James chapter 1 and verse 17. The Bible says that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change, shadow due to turning. In 1 Samuel 15 and verse 29, the Bible says, God, or records God's word saying, that I am not a man that I should change my mind. I cannot change my mind. Why can God not change His mind? Well, was He wrong to begin with? Well, He couldn't have been wrong, could He? Could He have not known what was going to happen in the future? Well, of course He knew what was going to happen in the future. He's God. That's sort of the definition of God, isn't it? So He knows everything. He knows what's going to happen in the future. It's inconceivable that God would be wrong. So whenever we do... Uh, see here in 1 Samuel 15, 29, that God can't change His mind, your response should be, well, of course He can't change His mind, because He's God, right? But did the human, human nature of Jesus, that, did that mind ever change? It grew, didn't it? It grew in wisdom, didn't it? And so there is a change there that's only in the human nature. Again, Psalm 102 uh, you are forever. All of creation will be rolled up like a garment. But you are the same. Uh, the same again in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8. Oh no. Alright. So, what we find is that the human nature cannot become divine. It's impossible for the finite to become infinite. Uh, the human nature is seen in Scripture. The divine nature is seen in Scripture. And both natures are necessary. So why are the two natures necessary? You can focus on the salvation uh, issue there. Uh, that for our salvation, you have to have true God dying for us. So you have to have both natures there. I really wanted to... Uh, talk to you and let you have some exercise with these ancient Christological heresies. 
uh, the Gnostic docetism that Jesus didn't have a body, that was what John addressed. Arianism is the idea that Jesus became God or that Jesus is the first of God's creation. Apollinarianism is the heresy that Jesus didn't have a human mind. Okay? Now this is probably where most of you were, wasn't it? Right? Well, we've known this is wrong for 1,600 years. Okay? Well, we knew it was wrong before that, but it was an idea 1,600 years ago. Uh, but, all right, well, we'll stop there. Uh, maybe this was interesting for you. Uh, and then we'll get back to Philippians 2 next time.
Good morning, and welcome to our morning service here at the Ripley Church of Christ. If you're our guest, we're honored to have you, and please come back at every opportunity that you may have. Uh, our first song this morning is not in the book, it's Heaven's Road. We'll sing all three verses, and if you will, please stand. <clears throat> Who's that walking down the road, carrying such a heavy load? Sinner, lay your burden down, cause you're walking down heaven's road. And when you're walking down heaven's road, you're gonna lay down my heavy load. Jesus said he'd walk along with me. Praise God, glory, hallelujah. I'm singing all the way. I got sunshine in every day. So won't you come along and join me on that heaven's road? Young folks walking hand in hand, singing with the angel band. Old folk ain't so tired no more, cause they're walking down heaven's road. And when you're walking down heaven's road, you gotta lay down my heavy load. Jesus said he'd walk along with me. Praise God, glory, hallelujah. I'm singing all the way. I got sunshine in every day. So won't you come along and join me on that heaven's road? Ain't no tears, no crying there. Ain't no sadness anywhere. Ain't got time to shed no tears. Cause I'm walking down heaven's road. And when you're walking down heaven's road, you gotta lay down that heavy load. Jesus said he'd walk along with me. Praise God, glory, hallelujah. I'm singing all the way. I got sunshine in every day. So won't you come along and join me on that heaven's road. Please be seated. The psalm before our scripture reading and prayer this morning will be number 881. Number 881. We'll sing both verses. <clears throat> I'm satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransom will shine, I want a gold one, that silver line. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. In that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder we will never more wander. But walk the streets that are purest gold. Don't think me poor or deserted or lonely. I'm not discouraged. I'm heaven bound. Just a pilgrim in search of a city. I want a mansion, a robe and a crown. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow. And someday yonder, we will never more wander, but walk the Scripture reading this morning will be from Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 15. Matthew 14, 13 through 15. As soon as Jesus heard the news, he left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. But the crowds heard where he was headed and followed on foot from many towns. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion and then healed their sick. That evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the village and buy food for themselves. Let us pray. Father, we come before you today with humble hearts. We praise you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for your many blessings in our lives. We thank you 
that you are here with us and ask your guidance and wisdom as we go through this worship service. Help us to open our hearts and minds that we may hear and do what you would have us to do, both young and old, who are doing the work of the Lord in his church. Father, please guide our elders with, with your wisdom, and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heavenly Father, we especially thank you for your son Jesus who died on the cross for our sins and was raised for our justification. Even the angels long to look into these things. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are visiting with us today and for all who are on the road during this holiday weekend. Father, please keep them safe, and may our visitors come and worship with us at every opportunity they may have. Father, at this time, we pray for those who have lost loved ones. We pray that you may grant them your peace. We pray especially for the McCarver family. Also, Father, we pray for those who are on our prayer list and those in the nursing homes, and for those who are sick or recovering from surgeries, especially Regina Morton, who is recovering from surgery, and Rob Hodges, who has been diagnosed with cancer. Heavenly Father, as your children, we live in your love and tender care always. Father, we commit ourselves to follow you every day, and we pray that your name will be glorified in all that we do. Forgive us of our sins. Grant us that home in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In order to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper this morning, we'll sing the, all three verses of 386. 386. <clears throat> Why did the Savior heaven leave and come to earth below? Where men His grace would not receive because He loves me so. He loves Before we take the Lord's Supper this morning, I'll be reading from Hebrews starting in, uh, in chapter 9, verse 22. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there's no remission. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another, 
He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as, is, and as is, it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. So we see from this passage that uh, there must be the remission of sins. Um, to, there must be the shedding of blood so that we can have remission of sins, even under the old law. Uh, but we see Christ, he, he only had to die once and not a yearly sacrifice as in the Old Testament. Uh, this was a much better covenant than the old law that pushed sins forward. So as we uh, now offer our thanks, let's turn our mind back to the cross and to the sacrifice that Christ made for us so that we might have uh, remission. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this day. We're grateful that we can come around your table this morning. Father, we're grateful for the sacrifice that Christ made, that he was willing to die on the cross for our sins and to uh, erase them forever. Father, as we take this bread, we remember Christ's body. Help us to turn our minds back to that. And help us now as we take out that we can do so that's in a manner that's pleasing to you. In Christ's name, amen. Let's again bow as we offer thanks for the cup. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this fruit of the vine that is the blood of Christ that was shed for us on the cross. We pray that each of us may take of it now as a, in a manner that's pleasing to you and that we can think back to this sacrifice that we can um, think about it in an appropriate manner of what, what this means for us, that we can have remission of our sins. Be with us now as we partake. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper. This time, let us offer our thanks for our material blessings and our offerings. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the material blessings that you give us uh, so mer mercifully and bountifully every day. Father, we pray that you will help us now that we can give cheerfully 
and not grudgingly we can give with a with a cheerful heart and that help us to use what you have given to us as what we offer today to further the boundaries of your kingdom these things we ask in christ's name amen Song before our lesson this morning will be number 625. We'll sing all three verses of 625. Zion's call sweetly rings over land and sea, bidding us look to realms above. While the light from the throne shines for you and me, let us listen to the call of love. Zion's call. Goodbye to loved ones. This is just part of life, this side of Genesis 3. That we all have to suffer hardship and we all must endure these hardships in a Christian way. So that even though our hearts are weighed down, we do not lose hope. But the question often arises of exactly how can I continue on as a Christian when I hurt so much? How is it that when we have suffered great loss, we can continue to believe that there is life after this world and life worth living in this world? As I have often done standing with people who have suffered great loss, I want to remind us all today that this is why Jesus came. That in the face of death, in the face of incredible loss, still yet there is overwhelming life. Now we can see then how we are to respond to loss the way that Jesus responded to loss here, first of all, in the death of John. Now as you remember here in John, uh, Matthew chapter 14, this story that's very familiar to us, as Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He's been raised from the dead, and this is why his miraculous powers are at work in him. Now here's the story. That Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. 
because John had been saying, it's not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod. The word daughter here probably infers that this girl is very, very young. Probably not a teenager yet. So maybe this gives a bit of a different connotation to exactly what's going on here than what you may have had, that it is not, probably not overtly sexual. But still yet you see here Herod, overwhelmed with pleasure and willing to throw his kingdom away to something that entertained him for just a moment. And Herodias' daughter, Salome, runs over to find out exactly what it is I'm supposed to ask for. And Herodias tells her daughter, here's what you ask for. You ask for John's head on a platter. Now, they could have asked for anything, but this is what she really wanted. She really wanted to get John out of the way. And Herod, even though he is a wicked man overrun with pleasure, reluctantly has to give in to this wish because he, before all of these people, has made this guarantee that I will do whatever you want up until half of my kingdom. I will give it to you. And what they asked for was John's head on a platter. Now, the story is here getting us ready to see the rest of Matthew 14. As we see there that John has lost his life, the disciples came and took the body and buried it, and they went and told Jesus. They went and told Jesus. As we started out the book of Matthew, and especially as we see the focus in the Gospel of Luke, John the Baptist and Jesus are very close. They are cousins. They share a lot in this same ministry. John is the one who is prophesied by both Malachi and Isaiah to be the forerunner, to prepare a people for the Lord Jesus so that when Jesus comes, there's already people ready. They've been baptized. They're repenting of their sins. They're ready for this new life that Jesus is going to bring. And it's John who baptizes Jesus in the Jordan River. It's John who continues to point people to Jesus. It's John who is there living his life, trying to build up Jesus. He says, he must increase and I must decrease. Whenever people ask Jesus about John, Jesus said of John that there has not been anyone born of women who is greater than John, that he is the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. Maybe you can hear him say or imagine him saying, by the way, he's my cousin. You can see the relationship there. And you can imagine the hurt. You can imagine the loss as Jesus is told what has happened to John. And so there in verse 13, when he heard this, he went away from there. He withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place to be by Himself. This is often what we do whenever we are encountered with loss. Whenever tragedy overtakes us. We don't really know exactly what to do, but we know that we need to get away from people and we need to think about what our next step is going to be. What is my life going to be like now? Now I need to really think about those precious memories. I need to treasure them up in my heart. I need to rewind them and play through them again to remember all of those good times. But what am I going to do now? How can I go forward? It's at this point when we are examining Jesus' response that we can put ourselves there because any time that I've suffered loss, and I imagine when you've suffered loss, you have withdrawn from people. You have isolated yourself. And it's while you were there isolated, it's while you're withdrawn, that you're trying to figure out exactly what you're going to do. Now, you can do one of two things. You can continue to focus on that loss. 
You can continue to be overwhelmed with that loss and let that loss overwhelm the rest of your life. So much so that you're never really able to move forward. So much so that it hampers, it, it puts this great shadow over everything else that you do. So that everything else about your future is about how much this loss has shaped you and how hard your life is now. But that's not what we find here with Jesus. What we find with Jesus is that He responds to loss by giving life. Here we begin here in Matthew 14, verses 1 through 12. Incredible loss. But the rest of the chapter is Jesus' response. The one who is life continues to give life. He does not let this loss dominate the rest of his life. Rather, he looks forward. He does not let this tragedy make the rest of his life tragic. Rather, he looks forward to life. And He continues to give life. So then, as we begin there in verse 13, we see this great record of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Jesus withdrew from there when He heard about John's death. He's there in this desolate place, but then He sees the crowds. He sees the crowds because they know Jesus is there. They see the crowds, the crowds see Jesus, and they want to know, can I come to you for help? Can I come to you for life? The crowds are coming. They're following Him on foot from the towns. Can't you see this massive event, this massive parade of people? We see here in verse 13 what summarized very quickly, but had to have taken over several days. As Jesus is still mourning the loss of His cousin, still yet here these people are following Him. Everywhere Jesus goes, these people are there. And you can imagine how easy it would have been for Jesus to dismiss them, to tell them to go away, to tell them He is in mourning. But that's not what Jesus does. He saw the great crowd and He has compassion on them and He heals their sick. He is still yet moved to help. He still yet has purpose in his life. He still yet wants to look forward. He still yet wants to make progress. And so he has compassion. He heals them. And the Bible says, when it is evening, the disciples came and said, this is a desolate place. It's exactly where Jesus wanted to be, was to. They said, this is a desolate place. The apostles think that this is a horrible thing. But Jesus wanted to be in this desolate place. He wanted to be here alone. Now they're here in this desolate place and they think it's hopeless. They think this place of grief, this place of sorrow, they think that there is nothing here. There's no life here. We need to go somewhere else. But here in this desolate place, where the Bible records them saying, the day is over. Can't you see here the emphasis on there being nothing left? This is how we often feel when we've suffered loss. We feel like there's nothing left. But what does Jesus do? He responds with life. The, the apostles say, this is a desolate place, the day is over. Send the crowds away into the villages to buy food for themselves. But Jesus says, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. In this desolate place where it's about to be dark, you be life for people. They said, we have only five loaves and two fishes. Five loaves of bread and two pieces of fish that we would look at as sardines. If I was there, I would hope that Jesus turned it into fried catfish. But this is what they have. Five loaves and two fishes. And Jesus says... Bring them to me. In this desolate place, it's almost dark. There's nothing that's going to give us life. Here we have just a little bit, but it's not going to be enough. When it's dark, life is over. Jesus says, whatever you have, you bring it to me. Whatever life is left, you bring it to me. I am life, and I will make you to have life as well. He ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. And he broke the loaves and gave to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the crowds and all ate and were satisfied. In this place where they thought there was nothing. In this place in Jesus' life, when you might think there is nothing. When life has been taken away, 
Here they are filled not only with this physical, physical food, but with spiritual life. They all ate and were satisfied. And they took up the twelve baskets full of broken pieces left over. And those who were about five thousand, those who were fed were about five thousand men, not counting the women and the children. The important part, though, is not the physical magnitude of this very real miracle. The important thing that we need to see in this record is that where there was nothing, where the situation was hopeless, the Lord provided. When it felt like all hope was gone, Jesus is hope itself. He fills them with nourish, nourishment. He nurtures their souls. He nurtures their bodies. And then He points to the fulfillment. Twelve basketfuls left over. Reminiscing on this, we can see Jesus saying, I am the true bread that's come down from heaven. You see, this is not the first time that God's people have found themselves in this situation. They are here out in the wilderness and they're hungry and they're wondering if they're going to die. You remember from Exodus, don't you? And in the Exodus there, they wake up one morning, they go outside and they find this food that they describe as manna. They go out there and they find this bread that's really thin. It tastes like honey and it's very sweet. And they say, what is it? The Hebrew word manna just means what is it. But they go out there and they find that bread every single day except for on the Sabbath because on Friday they've got twice as much. But every day then God has given them their daily bread. They're out there in the wilderness. They think all hope is lost. But there's manna from heaven. There's bread from heaven. They thought they were going to die, but God gave them life. What do we find happening again here with these 5,000 men, not counting the women and children? Here they are in this situation where they think they're going to starve. Even though Jesus Himself has suffered loss, they think they're all going to die. He is the bread of life. He is the true bread that has come down from heaven. And He is the one then who is able to provide. He is the one that is able to give them everything that they need. We see this again there in verse 22. Immediately after this, Jesus made His disciples get into the boat and go before Him to the other side. Jesus really wanted to be alone for a while, didn't He? He, got, he went off by Himself at first to be in a desolate place. He sends His disciples away so that He can be alone again here in verse 22. But that doesn't mean He's given up. He is going through a period of mourning. He is going through this time of sadness. But He is still yet Jesus. He is still yet salvation. He is still yet life itself. He is still yet going to give life again. So after He dismissed the crowds, He went up on the mountain by Himself to pray. And when evening came, He was there alone. Notice the similarities in these two stories. It was almost dark before Jesus gave them the bread of life. It's almost dark here again. Evening came. Jesus is there alone. And the boat has gone a long way from the land. And this boat is now out there in the water being beaten by the waves for the wind was against them. And it's the fourth watch of the night. You can see these fishermen noting the severity of the storm. And whenever fishermen talk about how bad a storm is, then you know something's really wrong. Because fishermen are accustomed to these things. They are accustomed to bad weather. And here they note that we are being out here tossed by the wind. The storm is great. The water's flooding over the boat. This is a big, big storm in our lives. It's something noteworthy. It's similar to what Jesus has experienced, isn't it? It's similar to this storm that Jesus is feeling in His human nature emotionally as He is there dealing with the loss of John. It's similar to what we experience when we go through the storms of life. Whenever wind and whatever life throws at us is beating us down. 
It's throwing us from side to side, and we fear what the future might be, not knowing if we're going to live and not knowing if we want to live the life that might be left. You see here the storms of life, but then we find something else. As we continue here in this beautiful story, in the darkness of the night, in the middle of the storm, in the fourth watch of the night, He came to them walking on the sea. And the disciples saw Him walking on the sea, and they were terrified and said, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. Now we need to understand something about the way the ancient Jewish people looked at the sea for just a moment. Anytime you see a storm in the Bible, or for that matter, anytime you see a storm anywhere in the ancient Near East, especially if it's a storm at sea, what you are seeing here is some sort of chaotic spiritual power being symbolized. Here we have a real sea, we have a real storm, but all of these things are sort of just built into the narrative. And so anytime someone says, you know, these poor people that we need to pray for, if they were to say roll tide or something like that, we would know exactly what they were talking about and all of the animosity that we have toward uh, the great state of Alabama just kind of wells up inside us, does it? Right? Can I say that here? Okay. But we have all of these emotions attached to this. And so whenever the Bible says that there is this storm at sea, we see this theme that's going all throughout Scripture, beginning even in the book of Genesis, whenever we see that the Spirit of God is hovering over the face of the deep. This chaotic water that is there, but God brought order to it. God's victorious over it. Here we see the same thing in Matthew chapter 14. We see here the Jews that are on the water. The storm is there. This is the place where spiritual evil is. In fact, many of them believed that demons actually lived under the water. And so whenever the water was stirring up, that meant that the demons were about to do something. But here's Jesus trampling over the demons. Here's Jesus trampling over the chaos. He is there in this place, in this spiritually scary place, in this physically scary place, and Jesus just walks all over it. That same phrase that we use to describe someone that just walks all over their opponent in football or whatever else it might be, that's the same image that we need to see here as Jesus is trampling these chaotic spiritual forces. As Jesus is walking on this place that's supposed to scare you to death. And so they look out at Jesus and they think, it's just one of these demons that's got out of the water. One of these evil spiritual forces is finally to get us. But Jesus is there. Jesus is there and Jesus is victorious. And so what we find here in Matthew 14 is not spiritual terror, but spiritual life. Jesus says, take heart. Be encouraged. I am. This is me. And because of that, you do not have to be afraid. I have defeated this darkness. I am champion over the storm. And I am champion over all of the storms of your life. Peter can't believe it. He says, Lord, if that's you, if you really are victorious over the spiritual power, if you really are victorious over the storms of life, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus says, come. And Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and he came to Jesus. You see, Peter is now enjoying Jesus' victory. Peter is enjoying the strength of God. He too is over, overcoming these spiritual battles. He too is overcoming the darkness. He is there with the Lord walking on the water. But then Peter takes his eyes off Jesus. And he was afraid. He began to sink and he cried. The prayer that we all need to pray... He began to sink down into the chaos. He began to sink down into the darkness. He began to sink down into death. He began to sink down into depression. He began to sink down into hopelessness. And he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately, the victorious Jesus reached out His hand, took hold of Him, and He said, 
Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now Matthew's already told us why Peter doubted, didn't he? Peter was doubting because he was looking at what the wind could do. He was looking at all the different things around him. He was looking at the chaos. He was looking at the storm. He was looking at all the things that was getting him down. That's why Peter doubted. He took his eyes off Jesus and he began to be overwhelmed with loss. He began to be overwhelmed with fear. But when he's looking at the Lord, when he's focused on life itself, then, G then Peter is able to overcome. Then Peter is able to enjoy life. Peter is able to enjoy being with Jesus when he's focused on Jesus. They both just walk on the water to the boat and they get in. The wind ceased. The storm was over. And those in the boat worshipped Jesus. As they're worshiping Jesus, they say, Truly you are the Son of God. Truly you are true God. I don't have to worry about the storm. I don't have to be overwhelmed with the storms of life. I don't have to be overwhelmed with spiritual darkness. I don't have to be overwhelmed with chaos. I can focus on you. And you can give me life. No wonder then we too cry out still yet, Lord, save me. As they get to the other side, they've crossed over. They come to land at the Gennesaret, and the men of the place recognized him, and they all sent around to all the region and brought to him all who were sick and implored that, he, that they might only touch the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well, there in verses 35 and 36. You see this same pattern repeating itself? You have these people who see Jesus. They come to Him to be healed. You have these people who are following Jesus and they're hungry. They come to Him to be fed. You see these people who are in the storms of life in this boat. And they see Jesus and they find victory over the storms of life. You get to the other side and the same truth is real, isn't it? You have these people who are hurting, these people who are suffering, these people who have tried everything that medicine can offer, these people who have been looking for answers, looking for help somewhere, trying to get rid of the pain, trying to get rid of the hurt. They see Jesus. If I can just touch the hem of His garment, if I could just be near Him, I know He can save me. And like Peter, they're crying out, Lord, save me. And what happens? The Bible says that they were healed. You imagine being the first one? The first one that touched Jesus' garment. And you're healed of your back pain. You're healed of whatever it is that's hurting you. And you turn to the neighbor and you say, Look what Jesus has done for me. Look at this life that He has given. The next one comes. He's healed of whatever disease. The next one comes. She's healed. Another is healed. And the crowd just keeps multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. Jesus never runs out of energy. Jesus never runs out of life. He is life itself. And He is able to overcome every illness. He is life itself. And He is able to overcome all of their pain. If they'll just come to Him. If they'll just come to Him saying, Lord, save me if they would just come to Him and be a part of His life. Jesus helps us then to be prepared to handle loss. We have seen here in Matthew 14 that loss comes in a lot of different ways. We have seen here Jesus dealing with loss Himself. And it helps us then to know what to do as we first look to Jesus who heals we look to Jesus who can take all of our pain and give us life. We look to Jesus who entered death itself and gave life. We look to Jesus who says that He is going to raise all people and that if we're in Him, we're going to enjoy the resurrection of life and be with Him in life, this eternal life forever and forever. 
We look to Jesus who heals. And when we don't know what's going to happen next, when we are suffering and when we're hurting and when we're scared of the future, we look to Jesus who provides. Just as He did in the wilderness, He does in this desolate place and He does in the desolation of your lives. Jesus over and over takes care of you. And sometimes when it seems that all hope is lost, when we like Peter, when we like Jonah have sunk down into the water and we're drowning in the things of the world, we're drowning with trauma, we're drowning in emotional pain, we're drowning in physical pain, we're drowning in the hurt of loved ones being gone. It's Jesus who pulls us up out of the water. It's Jesus who pulls us up out of despair and hopelessness. It's Jesus who gives life. So why not today then and every day, why not come to Jesus and say, Lord, save me. Over in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, the Bible tells us that we need to make that great appeal to God. As we see here that baptism, just like the waters washed away the sins of the world in the flood, that baptism now corresponds to this, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It's not just a physical bath. It's a spiritual bath. Because when you're being baptized, it's an appeal to God for a clean conscience. That's what Paul did in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. Paul says, the preacher told me, why are you just sitting there? You've been praying and fasting for three days. You get up and be baptized, washing away your sins. And this is how you call on the name of the Lord when you're baptized. Are you ready to call on the name of the Lord? Are you ready to be saved? Are you ready to cry out, Lord, save me? Save me from my sins. Save me from my despair. Save me from myself. Save me from the finality of life. Save me from the corruption of the world. Are you ready to cry out, Lord, save me? The Bible says that you must be baptized, but as you are baptized, you're raised to walk in newness of life. And every day we cry out to God, Every day we cry out to Him, Lord, save me. I'm Yours. Save me. Keep me safe. Keep me in Your love. Forgive my sin. Help me to focus on You. Help me to turn away from the world. Help me not to be overwhelmed with loss. Help me not to be overwhelmed with despair. But rather, let me fix my eyes upon You and enjoy You despite all the heartaches of life. Are you ready to come? It's how we handle loss. Are you ready to come? It's how we handle sin. It's how we handle life in this world. We, we come to Jesus. We come to be a part of His family. So won't you come as we stand and sing?
I'd like to thank Donnie for another excellent lesson and thank all of you for attending us, attending the worship service here today. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we'd like to know you're an honored guest and we invite you back any opportunity that you may have. I have a few announcements to read before we dismiss. Uh, please pray for Jimmy Wayne Robertson. This is the father of Nathan Robertson. He is in the ICU at Corinth. Also, please remember... Audrey McCarver's family. This is King McCarver's wife. She passed away last week. Her services were Tuesday. Please remember them and the Beach Hill congregation in your prayers. Regina Morton had knee replacement surgery on her other knee Wednesday. She is, she is home doing well. Pray for good results and a speedy recovery. Also, Rob Hodges of our community has been diagnosed with prostate cancer and will be having surgery soon. Please remember him in your prayers. Congratulations to Kadarius and Megan Jones, who got married yesterday. And also, we will begin our Wednesday night fellowship meals this week. Hamburgers, hot dogs, chips, and dip will be served at 6 o'clock in the fellowship hall. Everyone is welcome and encouraged to attend. We will have a sign-up sheet to get a rough count on the amount of food to prepare, but come if you sign up or not. Sunday night, September the 11th, after services, Youth Group Invasion will be at the home of Michael and Allison Harrison. Also, there's a sign-up sheet for the men's breakfast, which will be next Sunday at 8 a.m. If there's no further announcements, uh, I'll turn it over to Tucker, and Rodney McBride will have the closing prayer. If you will, please stand. Our closing song is going to be uh, the doxology. <clears throat> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father.